Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Sarah Mustafa from Dentist Channel Online. Welcome to today's webinar about endodontic separated files, the magical tricks. While we are waiting for the participants to join the session, I will introduce you to our company. Dentist Channel Online is a digital dental media company. It is your marketing solution for dental events, product launches, workshops, and courses. We also provide a collection of scientific articles and blogs about different topics in dentistry. We work hard to be your first-hand information on the technological advancements in the dental field. Now it's time to start the session about endodontic separated files, the magical tricks. If you have any question about this topic, please feel free to ask it in the question and answer box, and we will answer each and every question at the end of the session. I will start by introducing today's session speaker, Dr. Haysam Abdelaziz. Dr. Haysam graduated in 2009 from al Iskandariya University with honors. He started working as an instructor at the Faculty of Dentistry Department of Endodontics by 2011. He finished his Master's of Science in Endodontics by 2017. Parallel to this, Dr. Haysam graduated from Liverpool with a health economics degree in 2018. In 2015, Dr. Haytham inaugurated Microscopia Dental Clinic and Education Facility with the objective of being a microscopic and digital dentistry frontier in Egyptian market. He also initiated and delivered various training and education programs, including Microscopia one-to-one -one program, primary endodontics model, and much, much more. Welcome, Dr. Haytham. It's our pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much, Dr. Sarah. Nice uh, being here and nice being on the Dentist Channel online. Um, I'm very happy to not only be speaking about endodontics, uh, but uh, be speaking about a very challenging and common occurrence in daily endodontics that we face today. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, for the nice uh, workout throughout organization and arrangement of the day. Thanks for you, doctor. It's a pleasure to have you with us. So you can start the Very session, well. please. Very well. So uh, I will start first by uh, just putting, putting you all into the uh, sort of footsteps of what I will be discussing today. And I have a specific reason why I wanted to title my lecture today, Endodontic Separated Files, The Magical Tricks. Uh, and the reason why I did that is because I believe that a lot of people think about separated files or fractured files as one of the uh, headaches that you could face in endodontics, as one of the uh, cumbersome and complicated challenges that you could face in daily practice. Uh, and so many of us uh, think that this is their dead end, this is their sort of uh, 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 end game or the conclusion of what you can do to a patient whenever you have a fractured file. And in reality, this is not true. Uh, in reality, uh, a separated file is a very common occurrence, is a very, uh, is a very normal happening of our practice. It not only happens to the, to the beginners of us, but it also happens to every single uh, practitioner, to uh, experienced endodontists. It happens to a lot of uh, uh, high-end uh, microscope users and uh, uh, specialists uh, uh, on daily basis. Uh, it, this is why I thought that titling this lecture, The Magical Tricks, would make sense. It's not always about uh, retrieving or removing the separated file. It's not always about the bypassing protocol. It's sometimes just about how you manage the patient and how you manage the expectations uh, behind uh, what the patient feels and uh, looks for in the practice. Uh, today, I'll be discussing mainly three questions. I will highlight them into uh, or, or summarize them into five tricks and we will view two full clinical cases. Uh, of course, one thing to highlight before starting is that uh, this, the, this topic, this subject of uh, separated instruments and separated files management is uh, one that we discuss in uh, normally not less than six hours 
with a lot of technical details, a lot of instruments uh, to discuss, a lot of uh, uh, sort of uh, tricks and inputs that need to be mentioned. So this lecture does not aim to solve all of the mystery, does not aim to uh, get you to, to start tomorrow dealing with a separated file. It just aims uh, to highlight what could be done, when it could be done, what are the options available, what do we achieve as uh, clinicians, and what you can um, uh, so start planning to achieve in the coming uh, practice. Uh, I always like to, uh, to start with mentioning that I come from Alexandria, the beautiful pride, bride of the Mediterranean. Uh, it's a city that uh, overlooks the, the uh, wonderful uh, Mediterranean Sea, uh, and uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, things to see, a lot of things to visit. So I uh, recommend and um, I really uh, sort of uh, ask you all to uh, come pay us a visit uh, in Alexandria. You would enjoy your time. Uh, we are a destination that you could uh, see uh, during the summer and also uh, during the winter. The weather is really nice during the winter. Uh, we prefer it during the winter more than the summer. Uh, one thing I also like to start by mentioning is that all of, uh, all of my success, all of my cases, all of my educational content is created inside Microscopia Dental Clinic, which is uh, the clinic I uh, own and manage with uh, a marvelous team um, in which every single person contributes to a lot of uh, success and a lot of achievement. This is our clinic. We are a microscope-based uh, clinic where our practice is oriented towards uh, magnification and precision dentistry by use of digital dentistry. And then I like to start with the idea of uh, questioning this subject itself is a separated file management and advanced topic. Should only uh, endodontic specialists deal with a separated file? Uh, and what should you do as a general practitioner, as a beginner, as an experienced dentist, whenever you face uh, such a challenge? Uh, and in here, I like to quote what Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, unless you try to do something beyond what you have already mastered, you will never grow. This is how we learn. This is how we expand our knowledge and skills. Uh, there is always a first time for everything. Of course, this doesn't mean that uh, tomorrow you go out and you uh, invest into uh, tools and equipment and you decide that the next patient is going to be a retrieval patient. But it means that it, there is always potential. Uh, everyone can uh, manage a separated file, uh, not necessarily a specialist, not necessarily uh, someone with years and years of uh, clinical practice. However, you need to choose the, the patient, choose the tooth, uh, and definitely, definitely work on your experience and skills. So everyone should know about this topic. This is why uh, we are discussing it on an online platform for general practitioners. Uh, everyone should know what to select, uh, uh, how such a case would be managed and what kind of management should be done. And for us to, to see this better, I always like to ask four questions. So this is the, 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 these are the first uh, four things that should come to your mind whenever you have a separated file scenario. Um, whenever you see a separated file scenario, you look at an x-ray, uh, it happens in your clinic uh, when you are practicing or it, it, it comes as a referral. Uh, those four questions are very important to sort of know how to manage this scenario. But question number one is what are the treatment options um, that are available for this case. What are the treatment options that could be done in this case? The second question is, uh, what treatment option requires uh, exactly what? So if you decide to go for treatment option number one, what does this require? What kind of skill does it require? What, the, what kind of tools or equipment does it require? 
The third question is, what kind of difficulty do you expect? So is this very difficult, uh, meaning that it will require very high skill, specific tools, uh, and a long time? Or is it easy? You need to predict this in advance. And finally, how should you price this to the patient or to yourself or if you are going to refer this patient? How, how should you expect pricing? And these four questions are paramount to success with managing a separated instrument scenario. So if you want to manage it well, you need to know uh, the answer of those four questions. And I will take a couple of x-rays from the ones we, we see in front of us. All of these are patients treated by us, uh, all of them, uh, uh, fortunately, are patients that were referred because of a separated file. None of these were, were separated by myself or my team. Uh, however, uh, uh, we have similar cases that, uh, that were separated by us, so, so it happens all the time. So, for example, the first case on the left uh, is an upper lateral incisor with a long separated uh, uh, file of uh, 15 or plus millimeters. This is a, a final finishing file of pro taper next, separated all through the length of the canal. And it's the F3 uh, or the X3 file in the pro taper next sequence. Um, so uh, this scenario uh, um, is a scenario where you, you need to answer the four questions. What are treatment options? So treatment options would be in here to bypass the file, to retrieve the file, we will always go through these. To do a surgical intervention, so for example, to go for apical surgery or root amputation. And then finally, to leave as is and follow up. Those are always our treatment options. And then we come to the second part of it, what treatment option uh, requires what. So if, if you were to retrieve this, I will tell you in a while that this is not retrievable uh, just by ultrasonic agitation. This is not easily retrievable just by ultrasonics. So this requires a, a method or a way of grasping this instrument and pulling it out. Uh, if you are to go to, uh, for example, bypassing, you need to know that bypassing such an instrument is going to be really time consuming because it's a very long instrument separated in the canal. Uh, if you would go to an apical surgery, you need to know what is required to do an apical surgery in such a scenario. So you require magnification, you require a specific uh, set of tools to do the retrograde cavity preparation, to do the filling, you require some surgical skill, uh, etc. So these are requirements. And if you are to follow this up, what is required? It requires a compliant patient, it requires uh, a sort of uh, a very clear understanding of uh, how this would be followed up later on. And then comes the question of difficulty. And as we said, with, with every treatment option, you have to assess difficulty. So for example, this, is, uh, this looks relatively easy. It's a file that's in the pulp chamber almost. Uh, it's separated at the end of the shaping protocol. So it's not supposed to be really clogged or engaged into the canal walls. Uh, so the difficulty in retrieving seems uh, uh, relatively low. The difficulty in bypassing is relatively high because it's a very long file. The difficulty in doing a surgery in an anterior tooth is relatively low. This is an easy case to do a surgery for. Uh, and of course, there is no difficulty with follow-up. However, we know that follow-up uh, would not yield the best results in such a case. And finally, you need to know uh, how would you answer the question of pricing. So if the patient comes with this tooth to you, you need to really value quite well uh, how much you would price this procedure. So let's say, for example, just for example, you do a root canal for uh, $100. And this is just, just an example, okay? Definitely, you don't do a root canal for $100. I would say that you definitely do it for more. But let's say you do a root canal, a primary root canal for $100, and you do an implant just for the sake of discussion, again, for $200. Uh, I would say that normally the pricing of a procedure such as management of a mishap like the separated instrument should fall in between. So it should be 
just short of replacing the whole tooth with an implant and definitely more than a primary endodontic treatment. So this is how we see this with regard to pricing. And this becomes, of course, more uh, comprehensive whenever we have a more uh, challenging case. So this was the, the, the tooth on the very far left. Now, if we take the next one, the one in the second one from the left, and then we see all of the treatment options, you would see with discussion later on now that uh, I would eliminate follow-up. I would eliminate surgical endodontics. So this leaves me in here with either bypassing or retrieval. And we will discuss in a while that in here, because this is a middle third uh, file, that this is uh, uh, in a relatively narrow canal. So we, there is narrowness in the canal, coronal and apical. And because this is a relatively longer portion of a file, uh, and it's inside a curve, I would go for bypassing. So the bypassing require uh, option is my favorite in this case. And then I would think what bypassing requires. In here, it requires patience. It requires a lot of manual files. We will discuss this later on. And it requires the, the skill, the know-how of how to do a bypassing procedure. Uh, but then comes the question of difficulty. How difficult is this? And I can tell you out of experience and out of factors that we will discuss later on that this is relatively a difficult case. Why is it a difficult case? Because of the curvature, as we said, because of the fact that this is a small file in a narrow canal and the fracture was in the beginning of the shaping protocol. So there is, uh, as we expect, a lot of engagement between this file and the canal. And this brings me to the final point, which is pricing. Managing such a file with a bypassing uh, alternative would be relatively expensive. So this would go up to almost the cost of replacing the tooth with an implant, especially if we are talking about uh, a last molar tooth, especially if we are talking about a patient with no other molars in, his, uh, in this quadrant, especially if it's uh, a, a relatively young patient, healthy patient. So uh, the, the root canal treatment is um, a, viable, a viable option in this scenario versus an implant. So keeping the tooth really makes a lot of sense in this case. So pricing in here should be put into the consideration of how this should be done. And this goes on, of course, there are several cases we'll come back to, to these later on. So always ask yourself, these questions, treatment options, what treatment options requires, what the difficulty and the pricing. And this brings me to the uh, highlight of this presentation, which is the three main questions I want to ask and answer during this presentation. Of course, because of the fact, as we discussed, that the separated instrument management is a really uh, big topic with a lot of input into it, a lot of science and a lot of skills. Uh, and tools involved, it's always uh, healthy to highlight a specific part of this subject and to uh, go into the rest of the topic in, in milder or in, in uh, easier detail. So the first question I will answer is, what is the indica indication of each treatment option? So we will discuss uh, the, the option of bypassing, what is uh, the indications of it, and then retrieval, and then apical surgery, and then following up. The second question is going to be how to bypass a separated instrument in a predictable way. This is a very common question. Uh, every single one of us should be able to learn uh, to attempt a good bypass uh, procedure of a separated file. And then the third question is, how do we improve the success of instrument retrieval? How do we uh, sort of predict better retrieval chances? And let me uh, start by indications of different treatment alternatives. As we uh, saw earlier, uh, there are different scenarios with a lot of uh, potential for different treatment options. Uh, those are the four treatment options that uh, I want to uh, sort of discuss in this presentation. Uh, and I will start uh, opposite to how we would normally think. I will start with the option that uh, is less mentioned, which is leaving the separated file and following up the tooth. 
or what we uh, usually refer to as doing nothing. Yeah. And I would like to, to stress that there are indications for this. There are scenarios where it's wiser to leave an instrument. And uh, these are, for example, whenever we have uh, more risks associated with intervening than benefits. The classical example of this, uh, and I, I don't really have a lot of cases on this because uh, usually the cases that come, up to come to us require intervention. But whenever we are sent an x-ray and uh, a clinical scenario that requires or would be dealt with uh, with this treatment option, leaving and follow up, I definitely tell the dentist to do that and just follow up the tooth. And it usually works out very well. So when do we do this? What are the indications for leaving a separated instrument? Uh, the main indication is whenever you have the fracture happening at the end of your biomechanical preparation. So if you are already done with negotiation, shaping, uh, disinfection through irrigation, and uh, whenever you have uh, an intracanal medication session, for example, and then just before you operate, you introduce this last file that you want to use to remove intracanal medication to just uh, sort of finish further your preparation to activate some arrogant, yeah? So whenever you put this file and it separates in the system at the end of your biomechanical preparation, this is an indication of when you can leave this file and obturate quite well around it. Why do we say this? Because usually intervening with a separated file bears risks. As we said, you could risk pushing the file further beyond the apex, you could risk uh, perforating the canal, you could risk uh, uh, trying to attempt to bypass and then separating further files. So this is an indication when you could leave the file and follow up the tooth. The second important indication is whenever you have an inflammation uh, related endodontic treatment and not uh, uh, an infection-related endodontic treatment. This, this happens all the time, and, and we see this frequently. Whenever a file separates, uh, even if this was during the very early parts of the shaping, but this system was not infected. So you actually did proper isolation. You did your access cavity preparation under a rubber dam. Uh, you did the removal of the coronal pulp tissue, and you saw this pulp tissue to be healthy and just inflamed without, without infection, without pus, without uh, exudates or transudates. And you were negotiating and you reached the working length. And then just during your shaping protocol, you had one of the files separate. And you are 100% sure that this separation happened in a uh, healthy, clean, uh, environment, not in an infected environment. And this file to retrieve bears complications to the tooth. So for example, it's in a, an, in a severe curve or at the very far end of the canal. So it's, it engages the apical foramen, for example. These are really difficult files to bypass or retrieve. And the risk of uh, going there and intervening is sometimes more than the benefit. So these are usually the two indications where I would leave a file and just follow up the tooth. And the way you manage this is you just explain to the patient that during our procedure, we have part of the instrument engaged to the canal, and this part uh, is inside the canal. It's now part of the filling material of the tooth. And we were to follow this up, we were to uh, continue observing the tooth for a while to make sure that everything is fine. We don't expect any problems out of this. And uh, it, it's, it's something that happens uh, frequently and it doesn't contribute to success or failure. So this is where it's indicated to leave an instrument and follow it up. Now, the second option I would like to discuss is actually the surgical intervention. When do we go for root amputation or episectomy? And I will not go in, into further details on, on which to use and how to use it or 
into details of how to do different procedures. Uh, but I want to highlight that sometimes a surgical intervention in the management of a separated file is more conservative, more conservative than attempting to bypass or attempting to retreat. The main area where this is evident is uh, mainly, number one, whenever you have a huge or a large periapical uh, infection. So whenever you separate a file at the apical third, it's always, this is always the indication. We never go for, for a surgery whenever it's in the coronal third or in the middle third. But we go for a surgery whenever it's in the apical third and there is a zero chance of gaining straight line access to this instrument. I, I, and I will discuss what's a straight line access to a separated instrument just in a while. But whenever this happens, whenever, whenever you have the instrument at the apical end of the canal, and there is a huge periapical infection around the tooth, it's always wiser and more conservative to go to a surgical intervention. The reason why we say this is because actually uh, a surgical intervention is more predictable, is more uh, conservative compared to a non-surgical intervention uh, in cases where it is in the actual apex of the tooth and there is a chance of extra radicular uh, disease or extra radicular infection. Uh, now, the easiest examples to this are uh, scenarios of uh, the maxillary mesiobuccal root with a difficult curve and a separated instrument beyond the curve and a huge chronic apical periodontitis. The anterior teeth, all of the anterior teeth with a, a periapical infection and the long standing infection associated with the root and the separated file beyond the apex. And a very important thing, whenever the separated instrument is really long, so what we mean by really long is uh, 10 millimeters long, heavily engaged with the canal walls. Those are indications for surgical intervention because we now know that uh, retrieving an instrument that is very long is usually um, um, a very aggressive procedure to the root because it requires that you remove a lot of the dentin that engages this instrument. So this is why we suggest that with very long instruments, more than 10 millimeters or 12 millimeters, you would go for apical surgery. And the same thing applies to bypassing because bypassing a very long instrument in itself bears a lot of risk of separating another instrument uh, to the side of the already fractured instrument. Uh, and this brings me to the very common two scenarios that I would like to discuss, the retrieval and the bypass. And to be able to answer this, I always like to highlight three steps that we go through. The diagnostic workflow and the data gathering, the different options discussion, and the calculated informed risk assessment with the patient. And I would like to start with what are the factors that we put into consideration whenever we want to decide between a bypassing step and a retrieval step? And those factors are summarized depending on their relation to the tooth, uh, the operator and the patient, and the instrument itself. So factors related to the tooth are the following. One, the type of tooth. And this means uh, an anterior tooth versus a posterior tooth a maxillary tooth versus a mandibular tooth. Uh, how does this uh, relate to the choice of the treatment option? Uh, in general, in general, for all anterior dentition, there is no variation, or all maxillary anterior dentition, there is no variation between different treatment options. So you can do a bypassing, a retrieval, or a surgical attempt. In all anterior mandibular teeth, anterior mandibular teeth, we resort more to bypassing alternatives or a surgical intervention. We don't usually go for a retrieving attempt with mandibular anterior teeth. The reason why is because in mandibular anterior teeth, the amount of root dentin around the separated instrument is usually very limited, which makes the risk of retrieving way higher than the risk of, uh, uh, of bypassing the instrument. That's why 
uh, the type of tooth with regard to the location of the tooth. So the anterior teeth, maxillary, it's all the same. Mandibular, we usually go for either bypassing or uh, surgical intervention. With posterior teeth, it varies. So the mandibular right uh, dentition uh, is usually a preference for uh, bypassing versus the mandibular left dentition where it's usually preferable for retrieval. And the reason comes uh, or the reason stems from the idea of ergonomics. W to do uh, a good predictable retrieval attempt, you need to have the file head visible at least. So you need to see the tip of the file. And to see the tip of the file with mandibular teeth, you have to use indirect vision. We do that using the microscope. And the most complex position of the oral cavity to see the instrument is the mandibular right dentition because you are sort of uh, in a very tough and narrow position to view the file. Versus the easiest usually is maxillary posterior dentition, either right or left. So the thing is, uh, to summarize, the type, the location of the tooth affects the treatment decision with regards to uh, whether to go to the treatment option of bypassing or retrieval or surgery. Of course, for example, surgery is contraindicated whenever we discuss mandibular first premolars because those are very close to the mental nerve. Uh, again, maxilla, uh, uh, again, the same thing applies to maxillary posterior teeth with relation to the maxillary sinus. So whenever you have a separated file in the apical third of a maxillary posterior tooth that is directly related to the sinus, going to uh, any option other than the surgical option is going to be uh, more reasonable. So the type of tooth, the relation of this tooth to the surrounding structure is a contributor to the decision and the treatment, uh, uh, the treatment option. The second, uh, thing to put into consideration is the canal path itself, whether this canal joins uh, another canal or is separate. Uh, and this is important because whenever we have a canal that joins another canal, there is actually no significance of trying to retrieve the instrument because this is not necessary at any way because the removal of the instrument itself is not the objective. The objective of the the management of the separated instrument is to have accessibility to the apical part beyond the separated instrument. So whenever you have a joint canal, never attempt to go for a retrieval attempt. Just go for regular bypassing. And even if this does not succeed, you can leave the, 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 the scenario or the separated file as is and clean uh, before the file and after the file. So. The, the canal path itself affects our decision. And finally, the curvature in relation to the file. Of course, with curvature, uh, the management of a separated file becomes uh, a game of uh, very limited predictability. It becomes something that uh, is more dependent on luck than actual predictability. So with all curved canals, we suggest going for bypassing as the primary treatment because retrieval attempts are relatively more risky. Uh, you have the risk of trying to perforate or to uh, damage the canal path uh, during retrieval. The second set of, uh, of, of factors are the instrument-related factors. And these are actually the most important set of factors. Uh, and we start with the first thing, which is file size. And we have a golden rule in here. It's a, it's a very nice rule that says uh, that anything less than four millimeters is an easy retrieval scenario. Anything more than four millimeters uh, requires a more complex uh, methodology to retrieve. And anything more than, as we discussed earlier, 10 to 12 millimeters is not recommended for bypassing. So, so as you see, the file size affects our decision. So something less than four is an easy retrieval attempt, disregarding the, the rest of the factors, disregarding the position of the file, disregarding uh, the curvature of the root, putting into consideration the length itself. So anything less than four millimeters is always uh, a, a retrieval priority. 
from four to 10 is always a bypassing priority. Above 10, again, becomes a, a difficult scenario for bypassing. And you would go for either a stronger retrieval attempt or a different treatment alternative such as surgery. So this is how file size affects our decision. Second thing is file location. And the rule goes as uh, follows. Coronal files are easier to retrieve. Middle third files are easier to retrieve than apical third files. And the, the opposite applies to bypassing. So uh, it's not advised to bypass a coronal file. It's always advised to bypass the file whenever it's at the apical end. But whenever it's in the coronal end, you can achieve success with bypassing. However, however, always try to attempt to retrieve this file even after bypassing it, not to exert extra stress on the subsequent shaping files, uh, not to end up with two separated files by each other. Because each time the bypassing files goes to the side of the uh, of the initial separated file, there is a risk of engagement and uh, secondary fracture. Third thing is the file material. And here there is a lot of science. There are lots of uh, things to consider. Uh, but generally speaking, the more stiff the material is, like carbon steel files, uh, the more complex it is to retrieve this instrument and, and the more predictable it is to bypass. Uh, so we prefer whenever you separate a C plus file or an S finder or uh, those uh, initial negotiation files, we we prefer to go for bypassing of these files rather than retrieving them because they they tend to fracture secondary fractures. And the last thing is the cross section of the instrument, and this is also um, very easily intuitive. Uh, Whenever you have a cross section of an instrument that allows you, because of the fact of being safe sided or triangular, that allows you to go for a bypass attempt, that leaves you space to go for bypassing, always go for bypassing. And in a way or another, uh, with discussion, you will notice that we always say that bypassing is uh, the first option, bypassing is the easy and predictable option. And this is what everyone should be able to master. Everyone should try to bypass a separated file. It's just important to know when it's predictable and when it will uh, be less uh, uh, predictable and will cause uh, further uh, risks. Now, the last set of factors are patient and operator factors. And of those, I always like to highlight that experience is very critical. Equipment is then critical. Ability to pay, and I know that this, this might sound uh, strange, but it's very important to put the pricing and the cost into consideration. Whenever the patient is not able to pay, whenever the patient is not able to afford the, the complexity of the treatment, we always, always have to put into consideration other treatment options, such as extraction or just, uh, uh, as we said, following up and then dealing with it later on with uh, replacement uh, treatment. Because uh, as we will discuss with retrieval attempts, uh, retrieval is uh, an equipment uh, sensitive technique, is uh, a tool sensitive technique. So uh, there, there are specific equipment, you need to have ultrasonics, you need to have uh, magnification, and you need to have a lot of tools. You need to know what to use when, but at the same time have a lot of options because sometimes what doesn't work from the first time requires you to try something else. So the ability of pay is a factor. Sometimes we pay uh, more than 100 or $150 of material for a single separated file to retrieve. And this is, this is a huge amount of money. So $100 of payment which translates just to uh, a single uh, uh, fractured ultrasonic tip or a couple of wires uh, cut that we use for grasping, et cetera. So the ability of pay is a factor that you should put into consideration for treatment uh, planning. And then uh, also time. The patient has to understand and the clinician has to understand that the separated instrument management is a time consuming step. It requires you to have uh, 
the patience to deal with, with such a scenario, it requires you to put uh, effort and time into it. Uh, and I will give you some examples on this. Finally, uh, as we said, patience by you and by the clinician. Now, to summarize again, the four options we have are leaving a follow-up, surgical intervention, bypassing the instrument, and then retrieving the instrument. And those four options have to be weighted to, to sort of have the correct decision. Now I will move to uh, the workflow part. What do we do? How do we do it? First thing is tip number one out of this uh, lecture is how do you share these information with the patient? It's very important to um, share these pieces of knowledge. One is you need to share that managing a separated instrument is going to take usually more than one visit. I usually tell my patients, just for the management of the separated instrument, we might take three visits. Three visits each visit of 45 minutes. This is very important to share before starting the management of the separated instrument with your patient. So whether you go for bypassing or retrieval, whether you are choosing any of both options, you need to tell the patient this will require more than one visit, usually three visits each of 45 minutes. Because the success, if you spend two visits each of 45 minutes, this means an hour and a half altogether, and you retrieve a very difficult file or you bypass a very difficult file, and the patient does not appreciate this, this is a failure of the treatment. Even though you succeeded in performing the procedure, but you failed in the treatment as, as a whole because your patient does not appreciate it. So one first thing is it will require one to three visits uh, just for the file management. So for the negotiation and shaping of the other canals, for the pre endo buildup, for the isolation properly, you will take uh, uh, whatever amount of time you normally take. But just for the management of the file, you will take one to three visits each of 45 minutes. Second thing is the patient has to appreciate effort and cost. So the patient has to know that the reason why you are managing a separated instrument is to prevent a tooth from being extracted. Because if the tooth is extracted, he has to replace it with an implant. And this is my argument. This is very important. You don't manage a separated instrument just because you are managing a separated instrument, just because of this. You're managing this instrument because otherwise this tooth will be replaced by an implant, which has this amount of cost and this amount of, uh, of, of steps and visits to the dentist and a surgery and etc. So this has to be conveyed very well. The third thing is you have to understand and the patient has to understand that separated file management is not necessary as specialist, as I said here, but is a challenging scenario. It's not easy daily dentistry. It's not something like doing a, a class two filling. It's not something like doing bleaching. It's a challenging procedure. So do not underestimate it. And this is very important for my colleagues who refer patients to endodontists. So if you decided that, okay, this is this whole separated file management thing is complex, and I want to just refer it out to an endodontist, please don't tell your patients that go to uh, Dr. Haysam Adraliz, for example, and he will remove this and you come back to me. Yeah. Just as simple as that. It's not simple because we, oftentimes we get patients who come to the clinic and expect that we do this in 10 minutes. You go in, you remove the instrument, and you go out. And it's not as easy as this. Even if it's a relatively easy file, even if we have all of the equipment and tools, and we do, it's not as easy as this. So don't let the patient underestimate it. It's very important, both for you as a clinician, if you are going to do it, and for the patient to have an adequate expectation of this. Uh, so this is the tip number one. Always share very well the risk and the difficulty and the weight of doing such a procedure. This is tip number one. Now, moving to question number two. 
if we decide to go for the conservative option, which is bypassing the separated instrument, how do we achieve it? And my easy formula, and, and, and I guess this is not a secret uh, uh, anymore, everyone now is talking about how to bypass, bypass an instrument. I consider it um, a very necessary skill to learn to do this. It's all summarized in this slide. Uh, you, you use an active tip instrument. An active tip instrument is an, a C++ file, a D finder file, or an S file. This instrument aims to engage a catch. And then once you engage a catch, you do what we call file sequence cycling. And it's always in the sequence of smaller to larger files. Let me explain this to you. Now, Tip number two, to achieve success with bypassing. One, modify your axis cavity preparation and your orifice preparation. So whenever you have a patient coming in with a separated file, let's say a middle third file or a coronal third, third file, and you decide you will go for bypassing or an apical third file even, yeah? And you will go for bypassing. The first thing you do is not to take a file and try to push that file against the, the separated file. The first thing you do is to modify your axis cavity preparation and your orifice, because usually these areas are the areas which cause the separated file incident to happen at the first place. These areas are the areas where there is lack of proper straight line access to the canal system leading to the file to separate. So first thing first, always clean and uh, sort of remove any impedance in the path of your bypassing file. Second thing is make sure the canal and the area around the file is completely clean of debris. To do this, I always like to use uh, 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 an arrogant, a good arrogant, something like edit a solution, EDTA solution, and activate it promptly to remove all of the debris, because usually the file separates in the canal with a lot of debris involved. The canal is clogged with debris. To attempt bypassing, and this is a very important magical trick in my opinion, you need the canal to be clean. You need the system to be clean of any debris. Don't have debris in your pulp chamber. Don't have debris in, in any other canals. Don't have debris associated with the file in this canal. The canal has to always be clean. And then the third trick is to try as much as possible to visualize the separated file three-dimensionally and think and try to gather information on the cross-section of this file to be able to find the catch. And this is a very critical thing. Uh, earlier... A couple of years ago, we used to, to go to clini uh, clinicians and say, uh, try to know uh, which side is the curve and go against this curve. So we used to say, go on the inner side of the curve. And some clinicians used to say, go on the outer side of the curve because it's usually easier. And because of when the files fracture, they sort of leave space on the outer side. Some say they leave space on the inner side. And some say because most of the files are fractured with, with uh, a bit of uh, torsional fatigue, they would be involved more on the outer wall. So you try to bypass on the inner wall. What I'm telling you is this does not matter anymore. Do your bypassing attempt mainly at the area where you have a good catch. Whether it's on the outer side or on the inner side does not matter. And I will show you two cases, both on different sides, and we managed to have successful bypassing in both cases. Because what matters the most is to see where there is space around the file, where there is space in between the flute design of the file, and to go further into this. Now, to achieve this, uh, these, this is the summary of the tip number two. Tip number two, first thing is remove any coronal level impedance and any orifice level impedance. And if you can, also remove some of the dentin around the head of the file. And this is the picture on the left. 
straight line access. You need to be able to put your initiation file, the file that will initiate the bypassing, the file that will get the catch, you need to put it freely with ability to press it directly against the catch. This is a very important trick whenever it comes to bypassing. Second thing is use file sequence cycling. So you go in using the small file, number six, for example, and then you use watch winding motion. Now there is a, a, a small trick in here I like to highlight. Always try to use short, stiff files. Uh, and those files are to be used with slight apical pressure, short and stiff files. So short and stiff files. I like to use C plus files or D finders, as I mentioned earlier. And those files are usually used with apical pressure until I get a catch. So a bit of apical pressure, watch winding until I get a catch. And then I enlarge with this file with watch winding motion, always with watch winding motion, uh, 30 degrees clockwise and 30 degrees counterclockwise until this file becomes loose. And then you irrigate a lot. And then you use the next one, which is size eight. And you enlarge this space by the side of the separated file, and then file 10, and then file 15, and then you can go up to 20. And then what you would do is you go back to size six and you push it a little bit further. Now, remember, as we said, you have to always maintain that the canal is clean. The canal should not have a lot of debris to be clogged in this area to make your bypassing predictable. This is what we call file sequence cycling. And uh, the third aspect of the tip is to try to predict and uh, sort of plan where you will get the catch. Doesn't matter if it's on the inner side of the curve or on the outer side of the curve. What matters is it's in the space where there is uh, space on the side of the separated file. And of course, it, it always helps to know what kind of file was separated. But if you don't know what kind of file is separated because this is a referral, it's also still OK. Now, let me show you two cases. This is a case of an inner side of the curve bypassing. This is a long file separated the mesiobuccal canal of a mandibular first molar. Uh, we decided to bypass this file rather than retrieving it. As you see in here, we initiated the bypass attempt from the inner aspect of the separated file. Uh, why did we do this? Because this is where we had space. This is where we had a catch. This is where we were able to go further and further and bypass the instrument. This is the first scenario. As you see, uh, the progress goes uh, in order. We always like to take x-rays in between uh, each step and the other until we achieve patency. Then uh, this is the opposite scenario. This is the case where we achieved bypassing on the outer side of the curve. And don't uh, mistake it uh, because there are two files that are into the mesial system. Uh, the separated file again is in the mesiobuccal canal. Uh, first, we achieved patency of the mesiolingual canal. Luckily, in this scenario, both canals were joined apically. Yeah. Again, as we said, we just attempt to do a bypassing, not a retrieval whenever there is a joint canal. This is an apical third file. So the main canal was initiate, uh, negotiated and we achieved patency there. And then we tried to uh, start the initiation of the process of the bypassing. We found it's easier to bypass on the outer side of the file. So on the outer aspect of the curve. And in here, again, we achieved success on the far right x-ray, you will see that the bypassing file reached, again, the patency, even though it was on the outer side of the file, because this is where we had space. And, and I'm telling you this just to highlight the idea that we bypass on the easier path, not uh, specifically on, on, uh, on the inner side or on the outer side. Now, this is a summary of a case. I would like you to watch this. Uh, to see how we attempt our, uh, our bypassing procedure. This is a patient with several uh, separated instruments. 
the patient had uh, an earlier mummification treatment. First thing, and a very important thing is to always focus on modifying the orifice, on modifying the axis. This is what we do before we attempt to bypass or to retrieve the instrument. It's important to modify the axis. This is what we did. We tunneled uh, through the axis and the orifice level to be able to have uh, equal space around the separated instrument. Now, this is the small size file to get a catch. You see how we do this? Clockwise and counterclockwise. Clockwise and counterclockwise. This is a file eight. And it's pre-curved, which is important also, to be able to get a catch. Once we get a catch on one aspect of the file, this is the catch. We verify using the X-ray and the apex locator to make sure that we did not perforate. This is the steps further. We are using a rotary file to go past the separated file. Of course, there are a lot of details in here related to the shaping protocol itself. Again, always to be able to, to go beyond watch winding, a lot of watch winding, never clockwise rotations, not to engage the separated file and end up with uh, with uh, a secondary fracture. Always watch winding. We verify latency, as we said, using an apex locator and the x-rays. Of course, this is a whole case. So we managed to deal with mesial anatomy and distal anatomy. In here, we evaluated confluence to see if both canals are connected or not. We notice that they are not connected. Both canals are separate. Again, shaping beyond the separated part. Taking you further. Now, this is this is the, the image I wanted you to see. In here are the different uh, gutta perca cones after all of the bypassing took place in sight. This is after the obturation procedure. We used compaction in here to be able to obturate this and sealing all of the anatomy. I will just show you the final uh, obturation. This is the final obturation. We noticed that there is no confluence between the canals. So uh, all canals are separate. This is why we had to attempt uh, the bypassing of all canals and to achieve patency in all canals to be able to have a predictable treatment outcome. Now, uh, this is an example of a bypass attempt from uh, beginning to end. This is how it looks like uh, with uh, uh, the steps of it, of course, again, this is always the predictable conservative treatment option. This is what we should attempt to do first. Now, next is the retrieval. When do we go for retrieval and what options of retrieval do we have? We have two main categories of retrieval. We have retrieval uh, sort of based on agitation techniques. So to get the file out by agitating the uh, lubricant or agitating the arrogant inside the canal, thus removing the file or grasping, which is uh, holding that file using something and then pulling it out of the system. And both techniques are uh, techniques that are used to achieve removal of the files. Both have different indications. Both have uh, different scenarios where they would be used. And there are lots of options on the market 
that are used for grasping, starting from the micro tweezers, going through turf, turfine burrs and uh, multiple file twisting techniques, microtubing, uh, extractor techniques, what we call a cowboy technique or an endo cowboy uh, device or a BTR. All of these are different techniques for grasping, but the idea remains the same. We remove some tissue around the file and then we grasp this file and then we pull it out versus the agitation, which is we don't remove um, much tissue around the file. We just clear the space around the file for the ergant to go around and then we agitate this either using an ultrasonic tip or using a file that rotates in very high speed causing turbulence of the arrogant and thus pulling the arrogant out with which the file comes out. So it's either agitation or grasping. Now, going to tip number three, how do we uh, achieve success with agitation? So if, we, if you want to do agitation, where do you use this and how do you achieve success with it? Agitation is ideal for files beyond the curve, small in size, so less than four millimeters, and not heavily engaged. So whenever you have a file that fractured beyond the difficult curve, in a scenario where you, you had a very high uh, cyclic fatigue over the file, which caused it to fracture, so this file is not really engaged to the wall. Agitation is the technique to go to. Second thing is, use a suitable lubricant. There is a huge discussion on what kind of lubricant is to use. Uh, a lot of research comes in here from Yushi Terauchi, who is a Japanese endodontist, a brilliant endodontist. He recommends the use of uh, different oils. So he uses olive oil, baby oil, uh, other types of oils. I personally have tried almost everything. I don't find much difference. The idea is, you allow a lubricant, a solution to go around the file and you agitate this solution and this pulls the file out as we will see in a case. And then the third thing is the technique itself. How do we achieve success with it? We achieve success with it by having clear space around the file and by doing repeated cycles of agitation. So we put the lubricant in, we agitate the lubricant using up and down movement. And this brings the fluid to go around the instrument and go out and thus removing this instrument. Uh, the way we achieve this is first by having some space around the head of the file. We do this by using a modified gates. We use a gates glidden, then we modify the tip of it to uh, create what we call a staging platform. A staging platform is a space around the, the head of the file. We do this for a retrieval attempt using agitation or a retrieval attempt using grasping. The same thing applies. So we create some space around the head of the file. This is what we do. And then we either use uh, an ultrasonic based agitation, which is on the picture in the picture on the left, using an ultrasonic tip, we move up and down with the fluid inside the space, thus agitating the, the fluid and uh, bringing the instrument out. Or we use uh, a file-based agitation technique. The file we recommend for this is an XP finisher by FTG. This is a file that's not intended for shaping. It's a file that's intended for activation of arrogant. It agitates the arrogant, it moves the arrogant into turbulence, which moves uh, the arrogant around the file, thus pulling the file out. We use this in a clockwise rotation of 800 to 1000 or 1200 RPMs with very low torque of 0.4 to 0.6 nanometer, nano, uh, uh, NCM square. So this is what we use uh, for uh, agitating the instrument. Now, comparatively for grasping, we have a couple of things that are necessary. Uh, I discussed with agitation, you don't need to see the file. It's, it's not necessary. It's good if you have visibility, but it's not necessary. But uh, for retrieval using grasping, you have to see the file. 
So with any file that is separated in a middle or apical third, and this is important, you have to have magnification more than 8x, more than eight times, which means that any file that's separated in the middle third or in the apical third requires a microscope. Here comes the necessity of the equipment because you have to see if you want to grasp because for you to grasp, you have to be able to see this file so that you can position your grasping instrument over it. Second thing is always try to agitate the file to remove the engagement or to minimize the engagement of this file to the canal. Third thing is make sure you have sufficient or suitable staging platform. Of course, in, in clinical courses, we go into further details. What is a sufficient or suitable staging platform depending on the grasping technique? So if you go for a wire and loop, then you have to use the rule of thirds. If you go for a microtube, uh, sometimes it's, it's, it's just sufficient to, to expose a couple of millimeters. Depending on the technique of grasping, you uh, create your staging platform. The space around the head of the file depends on what technique of grasping you're going to be using. And finally, you choose the grasping tool according to the size of the separated file. The bigger the separated file, the stronger the grasping tool you need to use. So you go to a, a, a more uh, profound technique of pulling this file. So these are the different uh, sort of tricks that are involved with the idea of uh, removing or retrieval of a file related to a grasping technique. Now, uh, I will just give you uh, three examples. I will not discuss all of the techniques of grasping because these, of course, uh, require a more elaborate uh, venue and a more elaborate uh, space. But I will discuss uh, two techniques that I think are very easy. Everyone should learn how to use them, know how to use them, and whenever possible, try to use them. And then one technique that I consider uh, uh, recently the golden technique of retrieval, the easiest technique. It's a little bit expensive. Uh, it's, uh, it's more comprehensive, but it solves almost every single scenario where you need grasping. Uh, so the two techniques that I will start with are what we call a microtube with a file technique. This is the one on the far right of the presentation now. Uh, we use a microtube, which is something similar to a syringe needle uh, of different diameters. Of course, there are different options of diameters of microtubes. Uh, depending on the anatomy we are facing, depending on the, on the size of the lumen of the canal and the size of the separated instrument, we introduce this microtube and then we introduce into this tube another file. And this file has to be a small file, relatively small, but with aggressive threading. So this file engages the separated file that's already inside the canal and is limited by the tube, which makes it hold the other file. This is uh, by far the easiest and a very important grasping technique. We pull all of this together inside the system and we rotate the secondary file that we are using to engage the primary file, the separated file. And then we pull all of this out all together in one piece, as you see in the picture uh, uh, underneath. Uh, this is called a microtube with a file technique. This is one of, as I said, the easy, uh, important techniques that you should try to use. The second technique I recommend that you also uh, know about is whenever you have a relatively loose separated file. So whenever the file that is separated is relatively loose, is, uh, is not really uh, held within the canal, not engaged within the canal. A very easy and predictable technique to use is what we call file twisting. That's the picture on the far left. File twisting is that you use two or three or more files, depending on how much space you have around the file. And you twist those files all together around the separated file. So you put one file, it engages the separated file. Then you put another file on another side and you engage using it. 
and then you put the third file and engage using it all into clockwise rotation. So they all come together around the file and then you pull all of this together. So this pulls the separated file. This is, this is also a very nice and easy technique you could use for retrieval whenever you have a loose instrument that is separated at the end of your shaping and it's not hardly engaged into the bend. Now at the center, of this uh, uh, slide is what I consider the golden technique of grasping recently. The golden technique of grasping is what we call wire and loop based technique. This is, uh, this is centered around the idea of uh, using a small wire, something like a, an ortho flexible, very small wire of different sizes. We have a size of 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, etc. Uh, and those uh, wires go into a device that we pull later on to sort of shorten this wire. So we prepare the anatomy in a way to be able to place this wire around the head of the file. And then we tighten the wire to sort of uh, catch the file or grasp the file. And then we pull all of this system together out of the system. Now, this is something that works perfectly for uh, most scenarios where you need grasping. Of course, I I'm not explaining a lot of the details into it. There are different wire sizes. There are different companies that provide uh, such a device. Uh, a very uh, famous one of them is called BTR, which is my favorite. It's a Polish company and the one uh, I use in my practice. Uh, I have tried many other systems, and this has been the most conservative and the most predictable way of uh, uh, using grasping to retrieve a separated file. Uh, however, it requires, as we said earlier, visibility, straight line access, a good staging platform, uh, and uh, a bit of the skill on which size of the wire to use, how to place it, how to position it, etc. And then uh, when to tighten it to be able to pull it. Of course, it's it's more expensive because these wires tend to cut. So we don't usually get the separated instrument from the first trial. We put a, a first wire and then we tighten it and then we pull. Sometimes it cuts and then sometimes it goes up to three or four wires per single case. And of course, uh, you use this wire just once and it's a, lit, a little bit re or a relatively expensive. So it's something to put into consideration in pricing as we discussed in the beginning of the lecture. Uh, uh, let me show you another case. This is uh, a case where we did retrieval using uh, agitation. Uh, so just using ultrasonics and vertical movement uh, after we created a good staging platform and we allowed the arrogant to flow around the file, we were able to retrieve this file. Now, this is a separated file, uh, possibly more than four millimeters at the apical third. We start first by modifying the axis cavity preparation and modifying the orifice. Very important very important tips yeah before you attempt to retrieve you have to make sure that you have space all around the head of the file uh, in here we have some tricks we pre-bend the ultrasonic tip to be able to selectively cut on one side of the separated file this is uh, a special ultrasonic tip which we use to trough around the separated file again all of these are details uh, that are involved within the technique itself. A lot of irrigation all the time to be able to clean the debris, to be able to make sure that the canal is always fresh, free of debris, no clogging of debris is to, be, uh, is to happen. As you see, we have to have visibility. You have to see the head of the file to be able to attempt any retrieval. You have to be able to see the file. This is... Uh, a magnification of 16x, 16 times magnification. That's why it's as clear as this, yeah? We are doing now uh, what we call selective staging platform. 
we are creating space around the file to be able to pull this file and grasp it out of the system. Always uh, pushing a lot of arrogant and then activating to be able to, to get the debris out and to have a clean system, to have the arrogant flowing freely around the instrument. In here is a small trick. We always like to uh, trough or agitate the file on the area where it is engaged. So after you expose the head, you are able to tell more if it's engaged in the mesial wall or the distal wall or the buccal wall or the lingual or the palatal wall. Again, every time you push arrogant after you trough and then you agitate. Always cycles of uh, 10 to 30 seconds maximum of activation. You see now the instrument is ready. It's starting to move. There is the instrument. This is uh, almost a quadrangular cross section. So we know that there is a, a sort of strong engagement to the canal wall. Now I know where the engagement is because I'm able to move the file. The engagement is on the inner aspect, which is the palatal aspect in here. As you see, it's starting to move. Now I will try to put some arrogant and agitate all of this. At this phase, you can either continue with ultrasonic agitation or you can use a grasping tool and start to grasp the instrument. always putting in a lot of arrogant and then activating this arrogant. The more space of the file you are able to visualize, the better the chances is. As you, you noticed, with agitation, the file came out. This is an agitation-based uh, retrieval of a separated file. Of course, this is a relatively long file. This is uh, six millimeters of a length of a file. Then the rest of the treatment commences with renegotiation of the canal, shaping of it, uh, drying, and then of course, uh, obturating. I will not go into details of this. This is the final outcome with a post-operative x-ray of minimum uh, canal uh, sacrificing and maximum conservation. Uh, with achieving success in retrieval. So uh, this brings me to the last tip of my discussion, which is please to be efficient with management, inform the patient with complications, potential complications and alternatives before attempts. Uh, not all of our cases end with retrieval or bypassing uh, as a success. Some of the cases end with perforations that are uh, almost impossible to repair. Um, so you always have to discuss this in advance with the patient. You have to let him know that it might happen that this treatment doesn't end with a successful retrieval or bypassing attempt. And you might need to resort to an apical surgery uh, or uh, even an extraction of the tooth and replacement by implant. And this is a very important tip. And uh, with, with this idea, with this summary, I conclude we have different techniques. It's wise to choose the correct technique. It's wise to inform the patient in advance of the different alternatives. Uh, this uh, would conclude my presentation. I wish this was useful and informative. I wish it got you interested and curious to learn more about how to manage a separated instrument. Uh, this is definitely not the end of your uh, skill acquisition or uh, knowledge acquisition into learning how to manage a separated instrument. It's rather the beginning. This is how you begin to learn what to do. It exposes you to the ideas, the potential of different treatment options and uh, the modalities that could be uh, employed in your practice. Uh, of course, uh, this is just a slide for uh, getting connected through different platforms. We are trying to put effort into being on, uh, on Facebook uh, and Instagram and definitely uh, on YouTube. Uh, this is just a QR code for more content.
and uh, with this I conclude I wish if you have any questions I'll be waiting uh, and I wish this was informative and interesting for uh, uh, all of the participants are you there Dr. Sara? Hello, anyone there? Uh, if we have some questions. Can you hear me, doctor? Yes, now I can hear you well, yes. yes. Okay, so I wanted to thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Thank it you was very, a very much. Nice it was a very nice presentation. Uh, I think one of the participants wants you to uh, reshare the last slide, the one just before this one, the summary. Okay, of course, of course, there is it. This is the summary. I wish it shows now. Does it show well? Let me try to remove the questions and answers part. Uh, yes, doctor, it shows. Okay, very well. There you are. Okay, so meanwhile, I'll ask your permission to introduce our company to all the participants. And I request all the participants to kindly put their questions in the question and answer box. Of course, of course, I'll be waiting. So this is our organization, Dantes Channel Online, Healthy Smiles, Wealthy Lives. So Dantas Channel Online is the first uh, Indian digital dental media company. We did collaborations with more than 400 national and international speakers. We did two successful World Implant Expos, uh, and we have more th than 700 live dental webinars and much more. So please join our family and be a prime membership to get free certificate of participation after every event and get exclusive offers and discounts on our online and on-site paid workshops and courses. Today I'm introducing my promo code SAR100 to get a 100 rupees discount on your prime membership. So it will be around $9 per year. This is an example of the certificate of participation that you will get after every event. About our upcoming webinars, we have a webinar on March 11 with Dr. Yasser Talat Al Alawi about the parameters of smile design in a simple way, and another webinar with Dr. Tahir Shuaib about MIH. On March 12, we have a webinar with Dr. Aisha about the basics of root coverage procedures in periodontology and another one on March 13 with Dr. Daniel about introduction of laser dentistry in daily dental practice. On March 13, we have two other webinars with Dr. Verma about infection control in dental clinics and another one with Dr. Naval about her transplant surgery. About our upcoming workshops, uh, starting March 1st until March 10th, we have each day a workshop with Dr. Arushi about forensic odontology batch three, each day from 7 p.m. until 9 uh, p.m. Indian Standard Time. We have two online master classes, one with Dr. Jaina about communication, the key to a successful dental practice, and another one with Dr. Ankit about the art of interpreting the different shades of gray. I request all the participants to kindly save this number and then send a message on WhatsApp with their name so they will be added to our broadcast list and they will receive everything about our upcoming dental webinars and courses. So today's webinar is sponsored by NovaMind. NovaMind offers a full spectrum of implants and prosthetic solutions that accommodate any clinical need in modern implantology. We successfully supply highly demanded dental implant types called internal hex, tissue level, bone level, and active in conical connection. Our EU production unit and product quality is appreciated worldwide. Dental implants and dental restorative solutions produced maintaining all the standards of EU medical device regulatory. Products are manufactured in Athens, Greece, and distributed worldwide with more than 1 million happy restorations. So if you want to know more about NovaMind, kindly check their website. 
Last but not least, don't forget to follow us on our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Now we can move to the question and answer session. So Dr. Abhai is asking, can we also use H file for finding cache? Okay, that's, a, that's actually a very good question. Now, uh, can you use any file to find the cache? Yes, you can. It's just more predictable and easy with a stiff file. An H file is, yes, a stiff file, but doesn't have an active tip. Uh, this is uh, one aspect of it. You can use it, but the risk of having a secondary fracture is higher. And at the same time, uh, it's not as easy with an H file. What I recommend is either a D finder or a C plus file. Those files are easiest to find a catch with or, or to initiate the catch with. Okay, same doctor is asking uh, how to avoid perforation and in case where file is not retried or bypassed, would we go for extraction or obturation? Okay, now uh, the first part of the question is how do we avoid perforation? The way to answer this is you avoid perforation by checking every single time you progress with a step. So if you're going, if you're doing um, an ultrasonic staging platform uh, to do uh, a retrieval later on, um, and then you put your Gates Glidden file, your modified Gates Glidden file, uh, or you use an ultrasonic tip and you do some of the troughing. As you notice, every time we do some of that, uh, we check with an X-ray. Because the thing is, whenever you are not able to clearly see this anatomy, you have a very high chance of perforating. The other way of seeing is doing the x-ray. That's why I recommend that you evaluate your work every one millimeter of progress by using an x-ray. This is how you avoid perforation. The second way of avoiding a perforation is maintaining straight line access to the file because you are always more inclined to perforate the root if you are not centralized over the separated file but if you are centralized over it because you have a clear easy accessibility to the file uh, you are very unlikely to perforate now if you happen to perforate, what do you do? Do you extract and follow, uh, or do you keep the tooth uh, and follow it up? Uh, the way I see this, of course, is multifactorial. It depends on uh, the pre-operative uh, condition, depends on the amount of disease or infection around the root, and it also depends on the expectations by the patient. So whenever you have a patient who is motivated to keep his tooth, whenever you have a patient who expects uh, uh, that there is a margin of failure of any treatment, you would go with uh, keeping the, the, the file and keeping the tooth and following it up. Whenever you have a patient who is uh, not a compliant patient, who is a difficult patient, who has very high expectations out of the treatment and is not um, a patient who accepts uh, that there is a margin of failure, then I would recommend that you uh, immediately extract the tooth and go for a replacement treatment. Okay, Dr. Sanya is asking at the later stage of BMP, if a very uh, file tip gets fractured at the apical third, can we just leave that file there and continue with our BMP? Yes, yes. This is what we discussed at the beginning of the lecture. Uh, whenever it's at the end of your biomechanical preparation, whenever you are almost done with your shaping protocol, and then a small tip of a file fractures, do not attempt to do anything, especially if the anatomy wasn't heavily infected and you don't have a large periatical disease. So in cases where you did uh, a root canal because of irreversible irrever papitis and not necrosis or uh, a huge abscess, then I would definitely leave the file and obturate above this file and then just follow the tooth up. This is the more conservative option and this is not, uh, not clinically or academically wrong in any way. 
Okay, doctor, thank you for your answers. Dr. Abdurrahman is asking, during the attempt of bypassing, the use of C plus files might lead to a ledge because of the active tip of this file. How do I avoid this? And if this uh, is not possible, okay. should I use the DFinder because they're safe and stiff and have no active tip? And can I actually perform bypassing using K files? And what brands do you recommend? Okay, actually a very good question from, from Dr. Abdurrahman. Uh, the, the reason why we choose to use a C plus file or an S finder or a D finder even is because we want to have a catch. We want to initiate the bypassing sequence, but we don't use those files for the actual bypassing. But for the actual bypassing, we usually use just standard plain K files. The brand I personally recommend is Micromega. This is a French company which has a very nice manual files. This is what I personally like. You, can, you are free to use whatever you like. However, for the bypassing sequence itself, I usually use uh, the Micromega files and those are the ones that you will find in most of my videos. Um, but for initiation, I prefer to use the C plus files. Uh, now you said that the C plus might lead to a ledge because they have an active tip, and that the D finders are safe because they are not active. Actually, they are called the D finders are called a semi uh, uh, active or uh, partially active uh, tip files. They are stiff. They are definitely not as aggressive with cutting as the C plus. However, again. We don't use the DFinders or the C++ files for the step of bypassing itself. We use it only for uh, finding the catch, for initiating the bypassing. Uh, so this is, this is my answer to your question. For the bypassing itself, for the step of the file sequence cycling that we use, I personally use the K files. Uh, my personal favorite is the Micromega K files. Okay, Dr. Abhay is asking again the protocol for staging platform, and he has another question. If file is not retrieved and beyond Apex, what should be done, extraction or obturation? Okay, now uh, let's answer the first question, the protocol for the staging platform. There are, I, I didn't go into a lot of details into this because again, this is uh, a bit technical. However, I will answer uh, this question as elaborate as possible. There are two ways of doing staging platforms. You either do uh, what we call a circumferential staging platform or a symmetrical staging platform in which you use either a terrifying burr or um, a modified gates glidden file with uh, an ultrasonic tip uh, all around the separated file. Let me show you a picture in here. Uh, this is the, the picture where we have done the staging platform. Yeah, so in this picture, uh, you see we create uniform space around the file. I, I'm, uh, I'm not sure if this is showing well. Is it showing, Dr. Sara? It's showing, right, the slide? No, doctor, it's not. Okay, uh, so this is the slide now. Now it's showing, right? Also, no. Uh, Are you sharing the screen? Let me share it once more to, be, to make sure that it's sharing. There you are. It's sharing now, right? Yes, right. Okay. So in, in this slide, you see in the central uh, image, this is a, these are all drawings by myself, of course, just for the explanation. Uh, in this image, you see that we use the modified gates glid in to cut the dentin above the separated file. And then we use an ultrasonic tip on the side of the file to have this, this platform, this space around the file. This is what we call a symmetrical staging platform. An alternative to, to this is what we call a selective staging platform. So if you become really experienced with uh, file retrieval, you don't remove the dentin all around the file you just remove on the areas where you need to clear space around the file. 
So you use an ultrasonic tip, you pre-bend this ultrasonic tip, and you introduce it on the inner side or on the mesial side or on the buccal side, depending on how the anatomy curves in relation to the file. And then you selectively do the staging platform. Uh, and, and just so that you know, the idea behind the staging platform is to create space around the head of the file in the place where there is the maximum engagement to allow for the arrogant later on to go into this space and thus disengage the file. So uh, I wish this answers the question, how do we do the staging platform? Uh, either using an ultrasonic tip, which is called the uh, selective staging platform, or using uh, a sequence of Gates Glidden GG files, the Gates Glidden files with different sizes. I personally uh, never enlarge more than size four Gates Glidden modified. So I use size one, two, three, and then four uh, after modifying the, the Gates Glidden file by removing the tip of it to make it active, to be a cutting tip. And then I direct it towards the a separated file to be able to have this uh, area where it's uh, already cut around the head of the file. Now, uh, the second question you said, if the file isn't retrieved and is beyond the apex, what should be done, extraction or obturation? This is actually a very good question. Uh, and the reason why this is a good question is because it highlights an important piece of information. The patient doesn't have a disease because of the file. The patient has a disease because of bacteria that is inside the system that are not cleansable because of the obstruction by the file. So the file itself is not actually the cause of the disease. The file is just something that uh, hinders or prevents your instruments and your irrigation protocol for, from reaching the apical end, thus prevents proper disinfection. So whenever you have a file beyond the apex, I normally do not go for any trials or attempts to retrieve. I know that you see a lot of heroic endodontics where there are people who enlarge the apex and then start to agitate and start to pull the file into the canal and then pull it out. All of this is what I call heroic endodontics. This is not something useful to the patient. What is useful is to clean the system and obturate the system because the system is the cause of the disease, not the file. The file does not cause a problem. All of us uh, could live with parts of metal uh, instruments inside our bodies not causing a problem. The, the, there is a very low chance of your body developing a reaction to the file but a very high chance of your body developing a reaction because of remaining bacteria inside the system. So I always obturate and just follow up. I never extract the tooth because there is a file inside the bone. Whenever there is an, in, a file inside the bone, I just inform the patient that I will do sufficient cleaning and obturate and then follow up. Okay, Dr. Abdurrahman is asking, do you recommend using EDTA solutions during the bypassing attempt or will it create an artificial pathway? Uh, Dr. Abdurrahman, this is a very good question. Again, it seems that it comes out of experience. I don't use EDTA during the bypass attempt. I just use EDTA to remove any debris inside the system. But during the bypass attempt, I prefer to bypass uh, the, the file in a dry environment. So I use EDTA to remove any debris. You can replace EDTA in here with uh, sodium hypochloride or hydrogen peroxide or saline even, just to remove debris. But then during bypassing, I don't recommend EDTA because it softens the dentin and it has a higher risk of creating an artificial pathway, as you said. So I don't prefer to use, it, to use it during the step of the bypassing itself. A very good question. Okay, Dr. Uh, Abhay, we answered this question. Dr. Muhammad is asking asymptomatic teeth with the previous good obturation, but without final restoration for a period to retreat or to do final restoration. And then he said, especially if there is a broken file in this old obturation. Okay, 
Again, a good question from Dr. Muhammad, a very debatable point. Uh, the, the short answer to this is you have to judge it uh, case by case, which means I cannot give you a single answer for all cases. Because uh, good obturation is a variable because what, what, what a, a practitioner calls a good obturation is different from what a different practitioner calls a good obturation. Uh, an asymptomatic tooth is a variable because we don't only intervene based on the tooth being symptomatic or asymptomatic. You have to diagnose the status of the periapical tissues. So uh, you have to, to do sufficient uh, clinical examination, radiographic examination, and uh, evaluation across time to be able to say that this tooth is asymptomatic or not developing disease. And the last part of the, the, the equation is without a final restoration. What's actually a final restoration? Do you mean a gutta perca exposed to the oral cavity, to the saliva? If this is what you mean, so gutta perca exposed or gutta percha, depending on where you come from and how they teach it, uh, exposed to the oral cavity, so exposed to the saliva, definitely I would retreat. But if you are referring to uh, to the tooth that's obturated with uh, some kind of restoration that is not ideally sealed, then again, I would input all of the factors into consideration. Now, if you want to, to know the evidence uh, answer to this, the answer is we do not intervene, we do not retreat teeth if we do not have a justification for retreatment. The, a justification is not only poor obturation or a separated file. A justification is either clinical signs or clinical symptoms. Signs are widening of the PDL space, periapical redulucency that is enlarging or uh, not decreasing. Uh, uh, of course, um, any uh, kind of uh, fistula or sinus tract, all of these are signs. Symptoms are pain to percussion, tenderness to palpation, um, uh, swelling um, that, that responds to antibiotics, for example. These are the justifications that require you to retreat. So if those justifications do not exist, you don't retreat the tooth. You simply restore the tooth and follow it up. This is the evidence-based answer to your question. However, again, uh, I would conclude with the, with the beginning of my answer. It is case by case dependent. You have to assess every single case because it's a variable that uh, could be different depending on the patient, could be different depending on the scenario, could be different depending on the rest of the dentition, could be different on the kind of the procedure, the, the, proce the prothesis that you are going to apply. So if this scenario, happens in a patient with uh, a single tooth, it's completely different than happening where uh, this tooth is going to be an, a, an abutment of a long span bridge, for example. This variation is very important and this variation has to be put into consideration. And this is just a single example. So uh, never, never simplify, never generalize such a rule, always put into consideration everything uh, around it. Okay, Dr. Ahmed is asking, is there a risk in the trick of the modified reamer to push the fractured file far beyond and how to avoid, avoid such a mishap? A good question, Dr. Ahmed. The modified gates glidden will never push the separated instrument. Uh, the reason why is uh, because we only use this technique when we have an instrument that is engaged to the wall and because of the nature that the canals are usually tapered and the instruments are tapered, it's very difficult, very difficult, almost impossible that the instrument goes further into the canal. So there is no risk of you pushing the instrument using the modified gates glidden into the canal. What could happen is when you try to attempt bypass and um, you achieve bypassing and you enlarge the canal and then you start to put uh, larger files into the canal, you could push the separated instrument deeper into the canal. 
However, that's why it's very important to always be attentive, always take x-rays to evaluate how it's progressing. Okay, doctor, thank you for answering all the, uh, these questions. Uh, doctor Abhay is also asking when we should go for rotary, minimum uh, number K file should be used before rotary and maximum how many times rotary file can be used when it's the right time to discard? Uh, okay, again, again, these are these are good questions. Uh, maybe they don't relate directly to the to the topic of today, but these are, really good questions coming from, uh, from clinicians who are practicing uh, good dentistry. And uh, I wanted to answer those uh, again in, in the simplest way. When do we go for rotary shaping without using K-files, what we call manual-less shaping? We go for this almost always now almost always. So now, in most of my cases, I use rotary shaping without the use of manual files. Only when I have a challenge of negotiation, I would use a manual file. And I would never use the manual file larger than the size of 10 to 15, because I uh, employed uh, a long time ago now, almost three years ago, I employed the uh, technique of uh, glide path rotary shaping. So I use a rotary file for glide path rather than manual files. Uh, so the answer is always go for rotary. The second part of your question is how many times should the rotary file be used when it, and when it is time to uh, discard? The answer to this, a rotary time should be used only a single time, only a single time. This is what all manufacturers recommend, and you should discard it immediately after you are done with this session of shaping. Uh, of course, this is a very debatable subject. Uh, we can go back and forth on how to use and what to use uh, of rotary files to be able to achieve this. However, um, we can we can go into this in, in another uh, session of uh, understanding what are the biomechanics of the rotary files, how can we achieve success with them with minimum risk, but the general recommendation is the rotary file should be used only once, single use. Okay, Dr. Abdul Rahman is asking, are there any special settings for the ultrasonic uh, troughing to avoid cracking the tooth, then eventually leads to VRF, because several cases end up with a mechanical cause of failure? A uh, good question, Dr. Abdul Rahman. Uh, what is recommended for troughing is uh, a power frequency of uh, almost uh, 10 out of 20. Uh, on most of the piezoelectric ultrasonic devices. What is also re uh, recommended is the use of piezoelectric ultrasonics. Um, this is the first part. Second part is never use an ultrasonic tip in troughing more than uh, seven to 10 seconds. So whenever you trough, never use it more than 10 seconds in continuous troughing to avoid overheating, which causes cracking and leads to uh, vertical root fracture as much as possible, irrigate in between each uh, trough attempt and the other to be able to cool down and, uh, uh, and sort of control the temperature uh, of the anatomy. Okay, doctor, I think this is the last question by Dr. Mirna. Is there is any chance that the broken file itself might cause perforation while trying to retrieve it and how to solve it if it happened? Uh, of course, there is always a chance of a broken file uh, causing a perforation. However, uh, usually the, 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 the risk of perforation is more associated with the bypassing file rather than the initially fractured file because the initially fractured file is usually uh, engaged into the canal lumen itself. Now, um, the way... I see this if someone is asking how to solve a challenging scenario with a broken file and the perforation starts with 
one thing in the beginning. You have to see. For you to be able to see, you have to have a good straight line access to the anatomy and you have to have magnification. If this is a middle third occurrence and not a coronal third occurrence, I recommend, I highly recommend a microscope. Uh, all of this, all of what we are discussing becomes way more predictable when you can see it clearly, when you can direct your instrument in the correct path, when you can select where you are going to trough, where you are going to bypass, where you are going to, to utilize the instrument and the tool in the correct uh, uh, direction. So, of course, it depends on the case, but this is a, an overall uh, answer. Uh, there is a way to solve it. You have to see very well. If you are able to visualize the anatomy and visualize the separated instrument and visualize the perforation, everything becomes predictable. Okay, doctor, one last question, not directly related to the topic, but Dr. Abhay wanted to know how much time you take to finish single visit upper molar endodontic treatment. Okay. Uh, an upper molar with four canals, an MB1, MB2, uh, distal buckle, and a palatal canal, uh, usually takes an hour and a half for a single visit endodontic treatment, uh, not putting into the consideration the filling. So an hour and a half just for the root canal. And bear in mind that this is a practice where there is a, a microscope, um, an activation, uh, multiple ways of activation of the arrogant, uh, multiple sizes and standards of rotary files and manual files, and of course, uh, different obturation techniques uh, based on worm techniques and cold techniques and bioceramics, et cetera. And it takes me an hour to an hour and a half to finish a single molar with four canals. With three canals, it's usually an hour or 50 minutes almost. Uh, with four canals, because usually the MB2 is a bit challenging to negotiate and trough and clean and obturate, so it, it's it's an extra uh, 20 to uh, 30 minutes. Okay, doctor, that's it. Uh, you answered all the questions. I would like to thank you so much for this informative lecture, uh, and I would like to thank you for your patience to answering all the questions. Uh, we had a lot of questions, but this shows how much participants uh, want to learn from you, and they are very interested in your session. I would like to thank you for this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sara, for, uh, for being patient with the whole organization of the, the, the lecture and uh, with the, the timing and the change of timing and everything. Thank you for being persistent and patient and thank you for your time. It was really a pleasure having you on our platform and we would like to collaborate with you in the future, hopefully. The, the pleasure is mine. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful night. Thank you, doctor. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And you can uh, watch again this presentation on our Facebook uh, page and on our YouTube channel. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank Stay well. Bye -bye. Very good night. Bye-bye.